Hello, welcome back. Today I want to share with you, honestly, one of the most incredible images I have ever seen from a space telescope. It comes to us from the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's an image of a faraway solar system in the formation process. So there's a protostar in there, there's a protostar system in there, and it's a glimpse back in time as to what our solar system probably looked like billions of years ago when it was actually forming. And also, if you stick around to the end of the video, I want to do a little bit of a size comparison, showing you the size of this protostar system compared to some distances of uh, stars around us. And I think I can summarize it by just telling you that space is incredibly big. Whatever the number you can think of, think of something bigger than that, that is how big space is. It's almost unimaginably huge. So let's jump in and see what James Webb Telescope imaged. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has revealed the once hidden features of the protostar within the dark cloud L1527, providing insight to the beginnings of a new star. These blazing clouds are within the star-forming region of the constellation Taurus, and are only visible in infrared light, making it an ideal target for Webb's near-infrared camera. The protostar itself is hidden from view within the neck of this hourglass shape. An edge-on protoplanetary disk is seen as a dark line across the middle of the neck. Light from the protostar leaks above and below this disk, illuminating cavities within the surrounding gas and dust. Hidden in the neck of this hourglass of light are the very beginnings of a new star, a protostar and its associated star system. The clouds of dust and gas within this region are visible only in infrared light, the wavelengths that Webb specializes in, because infrared radiation can penetrate dust and gas clouds better than visible light. The protostar is a hot, tenuous clump of gas that's only a fraction of the mass of our sun. As it draws material in, its core will compress, getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and eventually beginning nuclear fusion, creating a star. Notice the dark line in the very center of this hourglass. That's an edge-on view of a new star system, a protoplanetary disk, or the disk of material being pulled into the star as it forms. It's about the size of our solar system, and it may eventually clump into planets, giving us a window into the history of our solar system. Light from the protostar is illuminating gas and dust above and below this disk. You can think of flashlights pointing in opposite directions above and below, each shining a cone of light. The blue areas are where the dust is thinnest, while the orange areas represent thicker layers of dust. Now, what I'd like to talk about is that this is a snapshot in time of the formation of a new star system. Our current theories of stellar and planetary formation are that gravity slowly attracts gas and dust from a very large period of space. And as gravity acts on these uh, tiny gas and dust particles, they clump together and begin to rotate. The system begins to take on angular momentum as it starts to rotate faster and faster. And as the clumps of gas and dust get larger and larger, their gravity gets stronger and stronger, which allows them to pull in more and more and more gas and dust. The central object of the rotating stru structure eventually gains enough mass to begin the gravitational process of squeezing the interior of that central structure, beginning the process of nuclear fusion, which creates heat and light uh, for the formation of the star system. Now, the outer regions, they clump as well, but they don't become large enough to become a star, and we could have different sized planets from many sizes, many times the size of Jupiter, all the way down to our very small planet Mercury in our solar system. So you can have rocky planets and gas planets forming outside, orbiting the main star. Now, this process isn't quick. It takes billions of years, but that is how we currently describe mathematically how star systems form. Now, I told you at the beginning that this was one of the most incredible images that I personally have seen. And I've seen lots of, all of us have seen lots of pictures of galaxies and things like this. But as we learn about our history, as we learn about the Earth, as we learn about the planets and the, and the star that we live near, we often wonder where do we come from? Right? And we have our theories. Our theories say, well, you have a swirling gas uh, uh, dust cloud that's swirling and clumping and gravitationally getting more and more intense and a star and begins nuclear fusion. 
begins to heat the planets up. The planets can be rocky or gaseous, and then, you know, eventually life can form and all of these things. That is our theory. But I've never seen an image up until now agree so incredibly well with our theory. You can see this tiny little black line that goes across this protoplanetary disk. That black line is a, a very thick layer of dust and gas that the light can't get through. That's why it's dark. All right, above and below, light is shining into the, essentially the nebula that's above and below this new star system. But on that direct line, edge on, it would be like looking at this paper edge on, it's extremely thick because in that region, you have the planets accreting and forming out of that material along with the sun in the center, right? Now, if you look at the width of that line, just look at the, the black line there. You can think of that line, that protoplanetary system being the size of our solar system. So that's a new solar system. The left edge to the right edge would be about the orbit of Pluto. And somewhere in the center is a star, and there could be any number of planets, maybe 10, maybe five, maybe seven, who knows? But they're in there somewhere. Almost all star systems that we know of now have, we now know have planets orbiting them, all right? So we now can see that this black line is the width of our entire solar system. So when you look at this image, I want you to take in what you're looking at. It's like looking at the Grand Canyon or a mountain and just being like, wow, that's so big. But when you're looking at this image, that tiny little black line is the width of our entire solar system. And when you look above, the hourglass coming up above and the hourglass going down below, you're looking at many, many, many diameters of our solar system across the top and the bottom of that hourglass. So I didn't do a super accurate count, but when I look at the width of that line, and I uh, that, that black line, the, the actual star system, and compare it to the, to the width of the hourglass, it's about 20 to 30 of those little lines can fit in there. So what you're looking at when you zoom out to this picture is the width of our solar system in the center forming, but maybe 20 diameters of our solar system, 20 to 30 of our diameters on the top part of the hourglass and the bottom part of the hourglass, right? So you're looking at a physically incredibly large swath of space and all of it is essentially forming into that star system. Now I'm gonna leave you with one final thing because I found it incredibly interesting. When you look at an image that big and say, well, that's one solar system there, and then that's maybe 20 solar systems on top and maybe 20 solar systems on bottom, man, this star system must be, the, the width of the cone at the top, it must be getting pretty close to the nearest star. Where is the nearest star to this one that's forming? That's what my natural question was, right? But then you have to come back to reality. However big you think space is, However big of a number you come up with, just throw it in the trash can and try to imagine something bigger because it's always bigger than any of us can imagine. Let's put some numbers to it. You might think, oh, 20 or 30 diameters of a solar system, it's maybe halfway to the nearest star away from it. Maybe maybe 10 times away, uh, uh, ten, it's, it's one tenth of the way to the nearest star. That seems to be a pretty big distance. That's probably what I would think, okay? Let's put some numbers to it. The closest star to our star system, to the Earth's star system, is a star system called Proxima Centauri. It's a, it's a binary star system with a Proxima Centauri and Alpha Centauri, they orbit each other. So it's really two stars. Proxima Centauri is a little bit closer to Earth. It's about 4.2 light years. That is the distance it will take light to travel in four years. That is the closest star that we could possibly ever reach with a spacecraft, four light years away. Now let me introduce you to what we call an astronomical unit. The one astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's called one AU, one astronomical unit. So the Earth, by definition, is one AU away from the Sun. So Pluto, when you use that scale of an AU, is about 39 AUs from the Sun. So round it up to 40 AUs. Pluto is about 40 AUs away from its position to our sun, 40 astronomical units. So when you look at this black line there, you can imagine in your head it's about 40 AUs because that's the, the radius is about 40 AUs. I guess it's about 80 AUs all the way across, all right? Because the distance from the sun to Pluto is about 40, 39 to 40 astronomical units, all right? So the question is, light years, four light years to the nearest star. How many astronomical units is that to the nearest star system. Okay, we'll put that into Google and you know what it comes out with? Four light years is equal to 252,000 astronomical units. Let me say that again. The nearest star that we know of to our planet Earth 
is four light years away, doesn't sound too bad, right? But that's equivalent to 252,000 astronomical units. In other words, 252,000 distances from the Earth to the Sun. That's how far away it is. So when you look at this James Webb Space Telescope image, and you see the black line down there, and you know that that's about the width the, or the, 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 the diameter of this newly forming solar system. And if you compare it to ours, you say, well, it's about 40 astronomical units radius, maybe 80 astronomical units in diameter. Just round it up to 100 astronomical units. The width of that star system is about 100 astronomical units, 100 AU. But the distance from our Earth to the nearest star is 250,000 astronomical units. So even when you're looking at the top of that hourglass, it's so tiny compared to the distance between our sun and the nearest star that you're not even looking at anything remotely close, uh, uh, approaching the nearest star to that newly forming system. So I guess when I say that is because I'm constantly amazed when I think, I know that space is big, but I always come up with a model that's always smaller than it should be. And when you look at a picture like this, you say, wow, that solar system is here. It's about 20 or 30 solar systems at the top and the bottom. We must be getting pretty close to the nearest star to this star system, but no, no, no. It's many, many, many thousands of distance units away. Not even close, not even in the same ballpark. So the moral of the story is, however big you think space is, it's much, much bigger than you think it is. And that goes for everybody, including me. So. I hope you've enjoyed this. I look forward to the James Webb Telescope imaging new star systems. Because James Webb uses infrared light, which penetrates that wavelength of light, penetrates dust and gas a little better than visible light, that's the only reason we can see images like this. If you image this in visible light, the dust would completely obscure what's happening in the center. But in the longer wavelengths, we can see through a lot of the dust and see these newly forming protoplanetary systems. So personally, I very much look forward and I bet we will see additional solar system formation images, protostar systems in the future from the James Webb Space Telescope.